UP are voting only basis caste, then who is voting for Mr. Modi in UP and Bihar? They are definitely not voting on the basis of caste. So there is caste angle. There is Bichardhara slash Hindu factor, Hindu Muslim factor, the religion aspect. The third is this Labharti governance, whatever you call. And fourth is your own electoral, electoral muscle, the organization, your ability to convert your support into vote. But what does Mr. Modi, according to you, embody today? What does he embody that, on the other hand, Rahul Gandhi does not? See, there are many, depending on who you are. You know, for many, Mr. Modi is a self-made man, man and, Mod and Rahul is a dynast. That itself is a reason for them to go for Mr. Modi. You believe but, that that is still there? The Kamdar, Namdar narrative still yes, runs? Yes. I'm saying nobody can say how much, but I'm saying this. Uh, if you put 10 people in room who are voting for Mr. Modi versus Mr. Rahul Gandhi, and you'll ask, why are you voting for Mr. Modi? I'm sure two or three will say this issue, that he's a self-made man, and Mr. Rahul Gandhi is a dynast. There are two, three who will say that Mr. Modi is honest, he's not corrupt, Mr. Uh, Congress party is corrupt. Under Gandhi, they, they have run a corrupt government. There are third element which people will say that he, under him the Hindu resonance is happening. So Hindutva is there, self-made man is there, and incorruptible is there, he's a hardworking, decisive person, he's bringing glory to India, all those aspects. We cannot say only one aspect. So different people find different reasons. But put together these eight, five, six issues which build Mr. Modi's persona or the brand, which allows people to say, okay, for this reason, I want to be with Mr. Modi. So as we come to the end, I want to look into the future. Ten years from now, Mr. Modi, who's been this dominant personality, will be in his 80s. Do you still see a Modi-centric, BJP-centric, Hindutva-centric polity, Congress declining, and maybe a new political force emerging? I, I don't know about 10 years, but uh, it would be very difficult for BJP to continue dominating beyond, you know, five years or so, because that would mean like going beyond 15 years of a ruling country. But what I see is BJP as a party, as a political formation, is going to be one of the dominant force around which the politics will revolve in 20, 30 years at least, like it was in case of Congress. Again, I must clarify, this doesn't mean that I, a lot of people think that I, they start saying that I, I'm saying that BJP cannot be de de defeated. Even if BJP is defeated, BJP will be the central political force around which the polity will move for another 20, 30 years at least. Somebody will emerge, somebody will defeat them for sure. In next five years could be done, could be 10 years it could be done. I don't know about the timeline and who will defeat. But no, would it be the Congress or a new political force in your view or regional parties? No, it has to be a Congress in a new form, uh, which... What, is, what do you mean by Congress in a new form? We, new we, leadership or new form? No. What see, is new form? I, ideologically, the cha one side is this right right to center right to center another is the left to center so left to center space is dominated today by congress and the congress has to reincarnate itself and come in a manner where it takes the dominant vote share of the left of center which is still is bigger than right of center so you don't see the likes of arvind kejriwal and all emerging to occupy I that told space you, you, know, you remember 2 3 years back uh, we had this discussion post bengal and i told you it's imp literally very difficult because in 100 years, last hundred years, this country has seen only two pan-India parties. It takes time. It takes 20, 30 years for you to build party, to reach the national, uh, taking a technical national party status is not same as being a national force, national political force. So for BJP, it has taken more than 50 years. Make no mistake, they started at Jansan. And they went to up to 50 seat. Then 30 years of decline. Then they re came, repositioned themselves at BJP. That take them, took them another 10 years for them to become a national force. So I, I would, I'm not somebody who would say that Congress is going to finish. The Congress in some form or other will remain the dominant force oppose, uh, op opposing the BJP's ideology and what BJP represents. In a way, you're offering hope to Rahul Gandhi and the Congress stay the course. I'm not saying Rahul stay Gandhi, I'm saying Congress, the, Congress. The, the space, left of the center. Space, the... I'm saying that in this country, left of center space is not going away. And broadly, that's what Congress claims to represent ideologically. So if Congress were to regroup, re-energize, uh, represent them, uh, re-position uh, themselves, they are, they, there is a denominator. There is a denominator to take. Final question, where do you see yourself? Do you see yourself now, what has happened in Bihar, opening up the possibility 
of a third force by 2025 Vidhan Sabha, where this duopoly of Lalu and Nitish may finally be over? Do you really see the emergence possibly for someone like you who can challenge this? Or do you believe it's very difficult to scale up or go on from a political strategist to building a party? Rajdeep, I I mean Bihar for the last two years. I have not I'm I'm not I'm I'm not planning to go Bihar because something has happened in Bihar yesterday. Two years I have left everything and I am stationed in Bihar moving village to village. And what I see and what I have learned and seen, observed in the last two years gives me full conviction that Bihar is just there to change. And you would be surprised the kind of change India is going to see coming in Bihar, coming from Bihar in their assembly election. Not in the Lok Sabha, but in assembly elections. You have to give a year because people are, as I told you, they are not looking at India. People in Bihar, they are looking to sort their issue out. And that would be reflected in the Bidan Sabha election. So you are very interestingly telling me that in a way, your hope is that even if 2024 Lok Sabha is almost a done deal, the state elections are becoming increasingly wide open and that's the real contestation that will take place but in the next few I'm years. If I'm in an opposition space, I would fight with all the might, the Lok Sabha, but I would not lose the hope and I would start preparing for each of the Bidhan Sabha, be it Maharashtra, be it Haryana, be it Bihar, from today. From today, not after Lok Sabha. But what will happen? They will lose Lok Sabha. Suppose they lose Lok Sabha, then three months they will go in oblivion, then comes the Bidhan Sabha election, then they will say there is no left time left. But if, you know, it's like the first line of fight is Lok Sabha. You must start preparing your second line and third line. And the real power, political and otherwise, rest with the state, winning the states. So that is where the hope is and that is where opposition should put uh, their focus. On. You know, it's interesting you are saying this because I recall in 2021 when I had interviewed you during the West Bengal elections, you had said that if uh, the TMC loses, India could be heading towards single party democracy. Now you are telling me multi party democracy is alive and well, certainly at the state level. Indian demo, uh, you know, Indian democracy has not been taken over by one leader or one. I am saying the same thing. Unless, so long the states are, even if you lose Lok Sabha elections again and again, but so long you hold your ground on the, in the states, India is. Democracy, its texture, its, its multipolarity are going to stay. And that is very important that even if you are not able to necessarily win Lok Sabha, don't give up hope, fight with all what you have, make sure that you don't lose the states. Maybe there is no opportunity for you to win Lok Sabha, but you have enough opportunity to win your state. Win that and the tide will turn. Okay. Prashant Kishore, for having given us a sense of what you believe is the big national picture as well as the state picture in this uh, huge election year of 2024. Thank you very much for Thank speaking you. your mind. Thank, Thank you. you for having me. Thank you. Hello and welcome to this India Today special. After Nitish Kumar's Ghar Vapsi yet again in Bihar, the dark clouds hanging over the Hemant Soren government in Jharkhand and the recent defeat of the Congress to the BJP in the Hindi heartland states, most political observers are saying that the 2024 general elections are a done deal for Narendra Modi and the BJP. Are the general elections of formality? Does the opposition still have a chance of making a comeback? Who better to answer that than the country's ace political strategist, now a political activist with the Jan Suraj movement that he has set up in Bihar, joining us now? the one and only Prashant Kishore. Appreciate your joining us, Prashant. Thank you. Uh, after the fall, or should I say the re-emergence of Nitish Kumar in a new avatar, this time back in the NDA, the general consensus is that 2024 is a done deal. Do you go along with that, that Nitish Kumar's decision has virtually made 2024 a done deal? Uh, yes and no, because see, Nitish Kumar, per se, him being part of the opposition bloc was not that big a deal, first of all, because on his own, he was not bringing something that would have turned the table. But perception-wise, yes, there was at least those who believed in the opposition's strength or the new formation called India. They thought him as one of the key allies or key component of this new formation. 
BJP, by taking him back, to my mind, has gone for a strategy where what we what one would say, uh, losing uh, a, a, a losing a war for uh, losing a battle to win a war, uh, because in Bihar per se, BJP is not going to give any advantage to BJP. But in terms of perception countrywide, yes. No, but the fact is, let's be honest. Now that the BJP has Nitish Kumar with it, they have Chirag Paswan with it, it appears that the opposition is decimated in Bihar, a state where the BJP not won 39 really. out of 40 seats no, last no, time. No, so no, the BJP really. seems to have virtually, you know, dominate, will now dominate Bihar. No, actually not. If you look at the hard data, in 2014, BJP fought on its own with the allies like Chirag Paswan, at that time Ramlas Paswanji, and they won more than 32 seats. In last general elections, BJP won 17, not 39. The, the alliance, with alliance, they won 39. This time around, with uh, Nitish not being what he used to be in 2014 or 2019, BJP and the India alliance anyway was doing pretty well. So I don't think BJP has taken Nitish Kumar back to add seats in Bihar. In fact, if you look at carefully, BJP's own number is going to be less in Bihar after taking Nitish Kumar because they will be fighting less number of seats. So why did B BJP opt for this? They have opted for exactly where you started this interview. That in terms of perception, Nitish was seen as somebody who is bringing together all part, who brought everyone together to build this India alliance. So by taking one of the architects out of it, BJP has given a severe psychological blow to the opposition, not in material terms. In material terms, Nitish does not, Nitish leaving is not going to matter uh, much. In fact, it's going to reduce BJP's number. And in assembly elections, BJP is going to pay the price for this. But they have opted for it knowingly because they want to win the war, maybe lose the battle in Bihar. No, in a sense, it seems that the BJP has decided that 2024 up ki bar char so par. You see, they are psychologically intimidating the opposition. Would you agree that all of this, therefore, it's the a, perception... It's a part of psychological thing. It is, uh, that's what I'm trying to tell you. It's not a tangible gain for BJP. It's a psychological blow to the opposition. But it's not as much the tangible gain for BJP as much the psychological blow to the opposition. But many will say that the opposition, in any case, Prashant, has not really taken off. This in, uh, India that's, alliance that's, that's has I'm, not taken off. So that's what I'm trying to tell you, that any which way it's not that with Nitish on with India that they were doing very well. BJP was anyway in the lead position. With this new thing, they have given a psychological blow to the all effort which was built around India Alliance. So why do you think this India Alliance has not taken off? Why do you think, is it because each leader of this India Alliance is restricted to his or her own state, has no chemistry no, uh, no, no, nationwide, no, no. It's, they it's, don't have a narrative beyond anti-Modism? What is it? Why have they not it, taken off? The first and foremost, the whole initiative came too late. Mm -hmm. They started only last year, June, July. Now, it, any sensible person, whether it is Nitish or Mamta or Rahul, Stalin, anyone, you might think how the seat adjustment would be, what the narrative would be, but everyone knew that there is an election in 2024. What prevented these leaders to form the same alliance, say, a year back? Just imagine if they would have done the same thing in 2021 or 2022. They would have got two years to sort out their differences. They would have got two years to decide the seat sharing. They would have got two years to reach to people, build a narrative, and would not have given a free run to BJP or NDA to build and play on their strength. So you don't think it has anything to do with the fact that they didn't make Nitish Kumar the convener no, no, of the all. alliance? None of that makes a difference. You no. just think that they got their act together too late. Too late because in six or eight or nine months in a country as big as India, when you are up against a very organized force, electoral force of BJP, you don't stand much a chance. I always say that anything and everything can be managed but for the time. I give an example, in 2019 results, Lok Sabha results, Didi got a setback in Bengal. So did Congress in Assam. In Bengal, within two months of Lok Sabha, we started the counter, TMC started the counter. They looked at what, what went wrong, they worked on their organization, they built their narrative. And by 2021, in May, TMC lit, gained 
everything what they lost to BJP, in fact, they gained a bit more than what they thought. Compare that to what Congress did in Assam. They also lost, but they did nothing. They started building the Mahagadbandhan and all their effort in Assam three months before the election. So obviously, three months was not enough. So is, is the Congress then the elephant in the room? That so long as the Congress doesn't revive or get its act together, this whole opposition plank simply will not take off? Yes, because they are the one who are fighting on 300 seats. And I always say that unless there is strike rate, even forget about India, what happened to India today. Just look at if Congress is fighting 250 odd seat. If they win 30% of those seats, if Congress's strike rate is 30%, then BJP number, the NDA number would be closer to 250, 220, than 320, 330. It's as simple as this. Forget about everything else. Let's Congress deliver one third on one third of the seats which they are fighting. The game will ch will change, but, it but they are not able to. Their strike rate is in low single digit. That's right. But their their strike rate against BJP. A lot of people do not pay attention. If Congress has won 50 seats, they have not won against BJP. They have won against Communist in Kerala. They have won in against AIA DMK in Tamil Nadu. They have won against Akalis in Punjab. They have not won anything against BJP. So the moment their strike rate against BJP goes 25-30%, even if it is 25-30%, you will see the balance coming to this opposition and ruling. Opposition. Sure, because most of these seats are in North and West. Both of these, uh, both, most of these Congress versus BJP fights have been in North and, and, and West India. And in both 2014 and 2019, the BJP demolished them there. So do you see any prospect of the Congress reviving? Or do you believe that is, as I called it, the Kamzor Kadi or the elephant in the room? Then unless the Congress revives, nothing is going to change on the ground. Unl I wouldn't say this. I would just put it differently. Unless somebody breaks into the north and the west frontiers of BJP, they are not coming down. And when I say somebody, it means if Achilles' party were to break, uh, um, say, BJP in UP, and they win 30, 40, 50 seat, it's a big blow to BJP. If Lalu Yadav can defeat, uh, Tejasvi Yadav can defeat uh, BJP in Bihar, that's another 20, 25 seats. If somebody, if Sarat Pawar and Udav Thakre defeat BJP in Maharashtra, then even without Congress, BJP will be brought to like 200, closer to 200. But the problem is, unless Congress and plus these three big regional allies, unless they get their, because it's not only Congress who's a strike rate against BJP in single digit. Same is the case with SP. Just look at their track record. In 2014, Achilles', Achilles party SP has won only five MP. When they fought in alliance with BSP, still they got only five. So if, unless SP number goes up, BJP is bound to get 60, 70 seats in UP. Same thing in, in uh, for example, Bihar. It's not only Congress. The RJD seat in Bihar is zero. So it's not only for BJP. Same goes for Uddhav Thakre and uh, Sarat Pawar. Unless these four or five key players in North and West who are taking BJP head on, their strike rate goes to 25-30%. There is no, it's very difficult how you are going to defeat BJP. Now, you know, many believe that part of the problem also is Rahul Gandhi himself. He's gone on a Bharat Nyaya Yatra. Earlier Bharat Jodo Yatra, now a Bharat Nyaya Yatra. And many say that unless Rahul Gandhi in a way says, I am not the prime ministerial candidate, the BJP will make it again Modi versus Rahul in some way, and that will put the opposition into a trap. Do you agree with that, that it is necessary for the Congress to say that Rahul Gandhi isn't our uh, prime ministerial candidate and throw up someone else, possibly See, a Malikarjun Kharge? I, I think it's not necessary. What is necessary is that Cong Rahul Gandhi allows somebody else to run the Congress if he's not running the Congress. Because look at... But he is running the Congress. He's running the Congress, but he's not saying that he's running the Congress. That is the problem. Look at whoever is advising them. This could be the worst time for you to leave headquarters and go for a yatra. Yatra was to be done maybe six months, a year before, two years before. Now is the time when you should be meeting with your strategic allies. You need to raise resources. You need to finalize your candidates. You need to firefight on daily basis. When you are needed at headquarters, you are in field. When you were needed to be in field, they were, then you were sitting in Delhi. I don't know who advises them. Just imagine 
you are losing a key ally in Bihar, whether he's worth uh, his name or not, that's a different thing, but he was a key ally. Rather than being on the ground sorting that issue out, somebody like Congress President Mal Mr. Malikarjun Kharge, I read his statement, he said, I'm hearing the report, well, I will reach Delhi and then I'll figure it out what has happened. When the deal is already done, he is, the next day by the time Kharge reaches, <laughs> Mr. Kharge reaches Delhi, Nitish Kumar is swearing up, swearing there as a BJP chief minister or NDA chief minister. So what I'm saying is, this is the strategic commonsensical thinking. You do not leave the, the commander of the army, you don't go to the field <laughs> when no, you, you have to be on the headquarters. No, but are you saying Rahul Gandhi should step aside or are you saying that Rahul Gandhi should be clear that if you are going to be the commander, act like a commander, yes. not be on a yatra at a time like this, be at the headquarters because managing... I, you and I know that no decision will happen when nothing important will move in Congress unless Rahul Gandhi approves it. And when you need that minute-to-minute -minute involvement and his decision-making, his opinion... He is in Manipur, Nagaland, he is in, uh, in Yatra. I don't think this is the best, best use of his time. So what I'm saying is he has to be clear. It's not about whether he's a prime minister face or he's uh, the campaign manager, he's running. I, you know, I, I read you, your tweet only. If you are doing this Yatra, a solo Yatra, then this is the worst time to do a solo Yatra. Then it should have been an India Yatra. Exactly. It should not have been a Congress Yatra. And if you are doing a Congress Yatra, then forget about in the India. You know, because you've often said that, and many believe now that Indian elections have become presidential. 2014, 2019, general elections are increasingly about Kaun Banega Pradhan Mantri leadership contest. Would the India Alliance pitching a Nitish Kumar a few months ago or a Malikarjun Kharge now or even a Rahul Gandhi, would that make any difference or that's not really I the was issue asked anymore? this question on Mr. Kharge and my answer was, whoever you pitch, be decisive, be clear. Look at the name proposal vis -a -vis, uh, with regards to Mr. Kharge. Mm. Two allies proposed his name. He, in the same meeting, said yes and literally backed out. His own party did not uh, offer a single formal statement to it. So, before getting into merit whether Mr. Kharge, announcement of Mr. Kharge as a Prime Minister face would add value or not, you have to first realize that whether you are making the announcement or you are not making the announcement. So, this indecision is killing them. Do you believe even the now? Is it too late now? Indecision that whether Rahul Gandhi is running Congress or Mr. Kharge is running Congress. Is Mr. Rahul going to be the Prime Minister face or somebody else? If he doesn't want to be the Prime Minister, let it be said in those many words by himself, nobody than him, that I'm not the candidate, whoever is decided. No, He's but do you believe that. that the India Alliance should have a face even now? I, I, I still go back and say if, if they have a face, definitely it will add value, definitely. You know, the reason I'm Not ask, having a face is not going to give them any advantage. The reason I'm asking you this is because the, while the India alliance appears in disarray, as you said, perception-wise, certainly, the BJP, on the other hand, seems to have got an extra dose of energy. They seem to be even more energized than they were before 2019 because of the Ram uh, 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 Mandir consecration ceremony. Do you believe that has now pushed Mr. Modi onto another level even compared to 2014 and 19 because now it's Ram, it's Labharti and it's uh, Hindutva. No, I don't think Ram Mandir thing is going to add a great deal of new vote to BJP. If it certainly has enthused the BJP's rank and file, it has given something to chat and feel good about uh, to the voters, but I do not see this event of Ram Mandir bringing them new votes. If there is anything, it is it has certainly consolidated their vote. The vote is, again, the, the vote this time is definitely for the Mr. Modi or against him. It's not about Ram Mandir. No, what is the B, uh, BJP's USP in 2024? Is it Ram? Is it Modi, Modi? Or is it Viksit Bharat? It's, it's Modi. And Ram, Viksit Bharat, Labharti, Hindutva, everything is now subservient to this brand Modi. What is Brand Modi? What is this secret sauce? Because you worked with him. What is the secret sauce of this Brand Modi? How is Brand Modi in 2024 different to the Brand Modi that you worked with in 2014? Well, Mr. Modi's strength is that he evolves. So, and he, his whole agenda also evolves every five years. So, in 2002, he's, he was the Hindu Hirde Samrat. Mm. By 2007, he became this able administrator who could 
bring development to uh, Gujarat. By 2014, he, uh, he evolved as somebody who can change India. By 2019, he evolved as somebody who can bring great pride and courage and uh, conviction in the story of India. By 2024, he is position, being positioned as somebody who has brought Ram back to this country. That is how he has evolved and everything what they do is, is subservient to this evolution. So the, the cult of Modi now is even bigger than that of the BJP. People are voting for Modi, not the BJP. Definitely. No, goes goes without saying. I'm not saying they are not voting for BJP, but I'm saying a bulk of the vote that is coming their way, Modi is the major decisive factor, but how will is you, the delta. How will you respond to those who will say that... You go to the field and many uh, mm -hmm. contesting uh, MPs would concede this, that but for Modi, they would find it very difficult to win with the same track record, with same Hindutva, with same Ram Mandir euphoria, with same Labharthi model. Just remove Modi, many MP candidates of BJP would find it difficult to win. Because in 2019, interestingly, CSDS post-poll survey showed that one in every three people who had voted for the BJP had voted because they said uh, they wanted to vote for Mr. Modi. Yeah. So in a sense, without Mr. Modi, the BJP is not the dominant force you are saying. It's like, it it's like imagining uh, Congress in 1980 without Indira Gandhi. You're likening, you, you're saying Mr. Modi today is in the same space that Ms., Mrs. Indira Gandhi was in 1980. He is Indira Gandhi of BJP. He's the Indira Gandhi of BJP. You're giving me a nice one-liner. Uh, yeah, but uh, politically speaking, sure. he is, his ability to catch vote is not necessarily dependent on ideology or, or, or organization or, or the candidate. People are straight voting the way they voted for Indira Gandhi. People are straight voting for Mr. Modi. No, but since you use the Indira Gandhi analogy, let me take that forward. Many will say that Mr. Modi has redrawn the way elections are fought. Uh, by, I know, see, my uh, comparison uh, the would not but, be liked no, by no, both no, sides. But sure. I, I'm just making sure. this comparison purely on this aspect of people voting directly for Indira Gandhi, same way people are voting directly sure, for Mr. Modi. Sure, but there will be those who will say that the BJP is now, or Mr. Modi, is drawing on a mix of state power, of media power and religion to overpower the opposition. So the opposition has no space in India to, to, to compete anymore. See, any leader who builds that kind of brand would have some ideological backing to his or her positioning. Indira Gandhi was also seen as Indira is India, India is Indira. Mm -hmm. She had this charisma and, you know, the control over state machinery as we call it, in totality, mm -hmm. be it judiciary, election commission, media, all together. So it's not that this is the first time we are seeing something of that in India. It has happened before. In between, we have seen uh, a coalition government where this con absolute control has probably gone a little down. And uh, also, as a society, we have evolved. Those systems are a little bit more robust than what it used to be, say, in 70s or 80s. But we have seen the abuse of power by those who have run this country, whether it was 356, using or misusing election commission and uh, media. It's not a new phenomena per se. The extent or the degree could vary mm -hmm. depending on who you are and who is analyzing the situation could choose to say, no, 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 the earlier one was bad, but not this bad. But it, the, as a society, as a country, we have seen it. No, no, the reason I'm asking you this is today opposition leaders are blaming EVMs want us to go back to ballot papers. Others are saying the enforcement directorate is simply targeting opposition leaders. Institutions like the election commission have been captured. A defeatist mentality or a, a wound, a victim, a sense of victimhood has gripped the opposition. That everybody, sab hamare khilaf ho gaye hai. The system is against us today. I, I, I doubt. I, I doubt. You don't that. agree with that? No, I don't agree. If that is the case, I heard Rahul Gandhi saying that. Free media, give media, make media free, ED, CBI free, election commission free, and I will win. Yes. Somebody need to just ask a commonsensical question. That in 2014, you were in the power. Media was very much under you. Election commission, judiciary, and entire system was under you. How did you came to 45? They argue, you, no, they argue the BJP and Mr. Modi have misused uh, these powers no, that you I, have. They no, have misused just, just, state just power. Just stick to that logic, that if... Congress party is losing only because of ED, CBI, machinery, election machinery and media, etc. Then how did they lose in 2014? Just tell me that. So I'm saying if you lose, whoever is in power, definitely they will use 
and would have some strategic advantage because they have control, they have more resource. But these advantages were with you when you were in power. Still, you were defeated. You know, and BJP with all these powers, it's not that they are not losing elections. They have lost many elections in the last five no, years. No, Prashant, the reason I, you know, today, interestingly, Malikarjun Kharge, the Congress president has gone to the extent of saying, if Mr. Modi wins, this could be India's last free and fair election. Well, I am not one of those who believe, I, and I could be wrong, but I, for many years now I have been telling this because he is not the first one. Many people have raised this issue. Arvind Kejriwal has said this many times. Other leaders have also said this. Many commentators also believe, and they say this in private also. I don't think, uh, I am one of those who believe that Mr. Modi can completely hijack the whole system here, change the constitution, become, uh, will become a dictator, and India would have no longer a democratic setup. I think we are underestimating the might and the wisdom of the common people here. Uh, nobody, no matter how, how strong that individual or party is, nobody can steamroll India and 1.3 billion Indians. Indians are pretty smart. They, they know where to give power and where to put the break. You have seen in last five years, the same Mr. Modi has not been able to win states as easily as he used to do, say, between 2014 and 2019. And if you go to villages, and I know you travel, Rajiv, a lot, you would hear many common people saying, are sab power ek hi ke haath mein thodi dena hai. Aap usse jab pooste ho, ki bhai lok sabha aur vidhan sabha mein alag alag kyo dete ho? Aap vidhan sabha mein karnatak mein congress ko jita ro, lok sabha mein keh ro, modi ko dunga. Kole nahi, ek hi aadmi ke haath mein sabko power nahi dena hai. Common people have this understanding. No, is that a trend that therefore is here to stay? That the same voter who may have voted, let's say in Karnataka six months ago for Siddharamaya, may well vote for Mr. Modi uh, in the general election. Same voter who may have voted for Mamta Banerjee in Bengal two, three years ago, may well vote for uh, Mr. Modi. We are seeing very distinct changes between Vidhan Sabha and Lok Sabha, and they can only grow in the future. Well, uh, this could be argued both ways. I, I have been telling this, that if you want to challenge BJP, this one data point should give you a lot of strength and courage and hope. Is that Mr. is... Mr. Modi's ability to fetch vote for himself versus his ability to get vote for his colleagues or his party. If you look at data from 2014 till now, between 2014 to 20, 2019, the BJP's underperformance in assembly elections was roughly around three percentage point. Mm. That means in Vidhan Sabha, only three percentage point BJP vote share was three percentage point lower than the Lok Sabha. Between 2014 to 2019, now, the underperformance in Vidhan Sabha for BJP is close to 9 to 10 percentage point. 10 percentage point. So, that means there are less and this is the declining ability of Mr. Modi to transfer vote. The double they, engine model is therefore is not working as effectively when it comes to state elections. No, I'm, I double When Mr. Modi is not on the ticket, the BJP It will is that much more difficult. I wouldn't say it is not working, but I'm saying it is that much more difficult for Mr. Modi to continue getting vote for his, uh, his party colleagues or his state governments who in eyes of people may or may not have delivered. Because one other major trend that... Earlier between 2000 to 2019, whoever Mr. Modi wanted, he said, vote for him, you, I will deliver, then people voted. Sure. But so if the state governments have not delivered, people are not taking Mr. Modi's word as gospel truth and voting for them. They are still giving it to him. But in the state elections, they are voting very differently. So that's one big difference between 2014-19 and 2019-24. to 24. The other trend uh, which one notices is north versus south. We mentioned how north and west, the BJP's 80 to 90 percent seats or they dominated 90 percent of the seats in western and northern India, Hindi heartland in particular. On the other hand, in the south and the east also, the BJP has found it much more difficult. Is that a trend also which you believe is here to stay? No, I, I cannot say we're here to stay, but it's very clear. It's not only north and south. East, I always say that east and south, roughly about 220 seats, is starting from Bihar. Don't count Bihar in north. Mm -hmm. In Bihar, BJP's vote share is never crossed 25%. Last time they have won only 17 MPs. So if you take Bihar, Bengal, Odisha, Telangana, Andhra Pradesh, Tamil Nadu, Kerala, this 220 seats, BJP gets only about 40, 45 seats, despite their success in Bihar, despite their success in Bengal, despite their doing better in Odisha. But what is happening, because they are completely sweeping north and west, these 200 seats or 180 seats, which are anti-BJP uh, uh, member parliaments, they are of no use. And hence, if 
Congress plus these three, four key anti-BJP uh, formations, if they are able to win even 100 seats in West and North, the game will change overnight. Because then these 200 MPs who anyway are winning as non-BJP MPs, they come into play. But you would agree that at the moment it looks extremely unlikely that the opposition can win these 100 seats in West and North. It's very I'm difficult. Very difficult. It's very difficult. Impossible? And, and more, I wouldn't say impossible, but more worrying sign is that BJP knows this data as much as you and I, I know. Probably they know more than us. And hence you see the BJP's effort and their organizational focus is completely on East and South. Look at the number of trips Mr. Modi has done to Tamil Nadu and Keral compared to, say, Madhya Pradesh or uh, Rajasthan. In outside election time, all his visits are to Tamil Nadu, to Kerala. Look at the effort Amit Shah puts in building uh, Telangana and uh, um, uh, Bengal. People are not paying attention. In Telangana, BJP got 14% vote. That's a very good launching pad for a party like BJP to take on Telangana. Similarly, in Tamil Nadu, I see BJP getting into double-digit vote share this time. Make no mistake, they will, bet anything between 7 to 12, 15 percent vote is possible for BJP in, in Tamil Nadu. In Kerala, they are already there in around 10 percent vote. So B while BJP is investing in their weak areas, opposition is not able to hold either their strong areas or uh, get into the new uh, areas where they need to work on. So I don't see any party, whether it's SP or, uh, say, um, NCP or uh, RJD or Congress, which is the biggest party in the North and West, investing in rebuilding, re-energizing, taking a new approach to rebuild their party in these states. You know, you, you've given us a nice broad national picture, but I, I for a moment want to look at your home state, since that's the one you've been traveling through extensively over the last 15 months, your, your Jan Suraj ex experience. As you travel, do you see a mood for change among voters? Uh, do you believe that voters in a state like Bihar also want change, want a better life? Uh, because one of the other distinctions between India is the India which is growing at a much faster rate, mainly Peninsula India, and an India which is growing at extremely slow rates, still has high rates of joblessness. Are these real issues uh, uh, before the people that lead them to believe they want political change? Rajdeep, it's a common sense. Who doesn't want a better life? It's a question of what defines better life for you. These estates like Bihar, the aspirations have been crushed so low that getting 5 kg free rasan is fulfilling of the aspiration. Getting uh, a 500 rupees pension is a fulfilling of an aspiration. Maybe in Karnataka you have to pay 2,500. But to say that fundamentally people in Bihar doesn't want good life is I think is a very derogatory statement to make. It is, whether it's for Bihar or UP or Odisha, you have to be in their shoes to understand what, what their life is, how difficult the life is. You are talking about better education, GDP, growth, this, that. They, they, you know, people are not getting to eat. People are not, they don't have house. You know, in Bihar, for example, you know, the oldest pension is 400 rupees. Just imagine sitting in Delhi. In 400 rupees, the poor woman or a man has to live whole month. His, rush, his eating, his household, everything is covered in that 400 rupees. No, which is precisely what I want to know. If it remains an area of darkness, why is it in the last 30 years it's been dominated only by two figures, either by Lalu Prasad, Nitish it's Kumar. In a way, Nitish Kumar has shown up the entire system. He can go with RJD one day, BJP one day. It's but Nitish ek, ek, uh, Bihar ke ek se hai. Yeah, no. It's because the two mainstream large parties who should have taken the responsibility of helping the states like Bihar, namely the Congress and BJP, both in the interest of getting more MPs in uh, 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 Delhi, they have sacrificed the interest of people of Bihar. It's like what we call the resource crust in Africa. The more mines, more minerals you have, more is the loot. Similarly, what has happened to UP and Bihar? These states have been seen by national parties or national formations as the states from where you get the maximum MP. So their predominant focus is how to get the maximum MPs from Bihar or UP. So what happened when Congress was in power? A sensible economist, as executive-like prime minister, he was 
even he could not think out of box to do something for Bihar because all they were interested in that with the help of Lalu Yadav get some 2025 MPs to run the government in Delhi. In return, if Lalu wanted to run <laughs> the government he wanted to run the way he wanted to run in Bihar, they overlooked, they closed the eyes. The same thing, unfortunately, BJP is doing vis-a-vis -vis Nitish Kumar. They are quite aware that Nitish Kumar is doing nothing. They are quite aware that Bihar is the most poorest and the deprived state, even today after 15 years of coalition government of BJP and Nitish Kumar. Make no mistake, out of 18 years of Nitish Kumar as a CM, 15 years he has been CM with BJP. But BJP is completely willing to overlook it because they don't want to take the risk of not getting that 30-35 MP seats. So they are sacrificing the interest of people of Bihar, the children of Bihar, because they want 30 seats from no, Bihar. But do you believe that caste-based parties or regional parties that are run around a family uh, or around an individual like a Nitish Kumar, are they reaching exhaustion point? Do you believe a stage will come where in the next 10 years, people will look for alternatives or are regional parties here to stay? You've told us Congress, you believe, is on the decline, but are regional parties here to stay? Yeah, so I would make a sweeping comment that there is like a curtain wall that, you know, from today onwards, there will be no regional party, no caste-based party. It's a cycle. It goes, it, what goes up will come down. If BJP comes down, whoever is a strong force there, whether it's a regional party or Congress, they will gain. If KCR is a, was a, is a regional party, he declined, Congress was there, they benefited. So whoever is there on the ground, whether you are a national party or a regional party, whether you are a caste-based party or a religion-based party, if you are there, you are fighting, people see yourself around, you stand a chance because the other person who is ruling, if he falls, you are there to benefit from it. But is caste still very, very dominant? Not just, I'm not just looking at Bihar, but across the country. Prime Minister also projects himself, interestingly, as an OBC face. I mean, this OBC politics, Nitish Kumar tried to play caste census, it didn't really work. Rahul Gandhi has echoed caste census, not worked. And on the other hand, the Prime Minister plays the OBC card. But I'm, I'm glad you're saying at least, because for months you guys have been telling this caste census is going to be the second mandal and this and that. And I've been telling it on ground, there is no resonance to it. No resonance at no all. No resonance. Why? Because you know in politics, you can play one thing only once in lifetime. You can't do it again and again. Caste thing once, mandal done, dusted, people who benefited, people who suffered, has done. Now you cannot redo it. Nitish Kumar tried doing it. Very quickly, he realized that it's not resulting into any electoral gain. So that's why he has gone back to BJP. Play this see. Caste is an important factor, no doubt about it. If you do politics in India, you must understand this reality that caste is one of the major factors. But caste is not the only factor. Make no mistake, caste is not the only factor. Look at the states where we talk about the caste politics most, which is UP Bihar. Today in UP and Bihar, BJP is getting the maximum vote, both states. In these states, you go and talk to anyone, they say, no, we are not vote voting for BJP, we are voting for Mr. Modi. How many people of Mr. Modi's caste live in UP and Bihar? Mm -hmm. So if we are saying that everyone in Bihar and UP are voting only basis caste, then who is voting for Mr. Modi in UP and Bihar? They are definitely not voting on the basis of caste. So there is caste angle. There is Bichardhara slash Hindu factor, Hindu Muslim factor, the religion aspect. The third is this Labharti, governance, whatever you call. And fourth is your own electoral, electoral muscle, the organization, your ability to convert your support into vote. But what does Mr. Modi, according to you, embody today? What does he embody that, on the other hand, Rahul Gandhi does not? See, there are many, depending on who you are. You know, for many, Mr. Modi is a self-made man, man and, Mo and Rahul is a dynast. That itself is a reason for them to go for Mr. Modi. You believe but, that that is still there? The Kamdar, Namdar narrative still yes, runs? Yes. I'm saying nobody can say how much, but I'm saying this. Uh, if you put 10 people in room who are voting for Mr. Modi versus Mr. Rahul Gandhi, and you'll ask, why are you voting for Mr. Modi? I'm sure two or three will say this issue, that he's a self-made man, and Mr. Rahul Gandhi is a dynast. There are two, three who will say that Mr. Modi is honest, he's not corrupt, Mr. Uh, Congress party is corrupt. Under Gandhi, they, they have run a corrupt government. There are third element which people will say that he, under him the Hindu resonance is happening. So Hindutva is there, self-made man is there, un incorruptible is there, he's a hardworking, decisive person, he's bringing glory to India, all those aspects. We cannot say only one aspect. So different people find different reasons. But put together these eight 
five, six issues which build Mr. Modi's persona or the brand, which allows people to say, okay, for this reason, I want to be with Mr. Modi. So as we come to the end, I want to look into the future. Ten years from now, Mr. Modi, who's been this dominant personality, will be in his 80s. Do you still see a Modi-centric, BJP-centric, Hindutva-centric polity, Congress declining, and maybe a new political force emerging? I, I don't know about 10 years, but uh, it would be very difficult for BJP to continue dominating beyond, you know, five years or so, because that would mean like going beyond 15 years of a ruling country. But what I see is BJP as a party, as a political formation, is going to be one of the dominant force around which the politics will revolve in 20, 30 years at least, like it was in case of Congress. Again, I must clarify, this doesn't mean that I, a lot of people think that I, they start saying that I, I'm saying that BJP cannot be de de defeated. Even if BJP is defeated, BJP will be the central political force around which the polity will move for another 20, 30 years at least. Somebody will emerge, somebody will defeat them for sure. In next five years could be done, could be 10 years it could be done. I don't know about the timeline and who will defeat. But no, would it be the Congress or a new political force in your view or regional parties? No, it has to be a Congress in a new form, uh, which... What, is, what do you mean by Congress in a new form? We, new we, leadership or new form? No. What see, is new form? I, mean? Ideologically, the cha one side is this right right to center right to center another is the left to center so left to center space is dominated today by congress and the congress has to reincarnate itself and come in a manner where it takes the dominant vote share of the left of center which is still is bigger than right of center so you don't see the likes of arvind kejriwal and all emerging to occupy I that told space you, you, know, you remember 2 3 years back uh, we had this discussion post bengal and i told you it's literally very difficult because in 100 years, last hundred years, this country has seen only two pan-India parties. It takes time. It takes 20, 30 years for you to build party, to reach the national, uh, taking a technical national party status is not same as being a national force, national political force. So for BJP, it has taken more than 50 years. Make no mistake, they started at Jansan and they went to up to 50 seat, then 30 years of decline, then they re came, repositioned themselves at BJP. That take them, took them another 10 years for them to become a national force. So I, I would, I'm not somebody who would say that Congress is going to finish. The Congress in some form or other will remain the dominant force oppose, uh, op opposing the BJP's ideology and what BJP represents. In a way, you are offering hope to Rahul Gandhi and the Congress stay the course. I'm not saying Rahul stay Gandhi, I'm saying Congress, the, Congress. The, the space, left of centre. I'm saying that in this country, left of centre space is not going away. And broadly, that's what Congress claims to represent ideologically. So if Congress were to regroup, re-energize, uh, represent, them, uh, re, um, uh, position themselves, they are, they, there is a denominator. There is a denominator to take. Final question, where do you see yourself? Do you see yourself now, what has happened in Bihar, opening up the possibility of a third force by 2025 Vidhan Sabha, where this duopoly of Lalu and Nitish may finally be over? Do you really see the emergence, possibly for someone like you, who can challenge this? Or do you believe it's very difficult to scale up or go on from a political strategist to building a party? Rajdeep, I am in Bihar for the last two years. I have not, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm not planning to go Bihar because something has happened in Bihar yesterday. Two years, I have left everything and I am stationed in Bihar, moving village to village. And what I see and what I have learned and seen, observed in the last two years gives me full conviction that Bihar is just there to change. And you would be surprised the kind of change India is going to see coming in Bihar, coming from Bihar in their assembly election, not in the Lok Sabha, but in assembly elections. You have to give a year because people are, as I told you, they are not looking at India. People in Bihar, they are looking to sort their issue out and that would be reflected in the Bidan Sabha election. So you're very interestingly telling me that in a way, your hope is that even if 2024 Lok Sabha is almost a done deal, the state elections are becoming increasingly wide open and that's the real contestation that will take place but in the next few I'm years. If I'm in an opposition space, I would fight with all the might, the Lok Sabha, but I would not lose the hope and I would start preparing for each of the Vidhan Sabha, be it Maharashtra, be it Haryana, be it Bihar, 
from today, from today, not after Lok Sabha. But what will happen? They will lose Lok Suppose they lose Lok Sabha, then three months they will go in oblivion. Then comes the Vidhan Sabha election, then they will say there is no left time left. But if, you know, it's like the first line of fight is Lok Sabha. You must start preparing your second line and third line. And the real power, political and otherwise, rest with the state, winning the states. So that is where the hope is and that is where opposition should put uh, their focus on. You know, it's interesting you are saying this because I recall in 2021 when I had interviewed you during the West Bengal elections, you had said that if uh, the TMC loses, India could be heading towards single party democracy. Now you are telling me multi-party democracy is alive and well certainly at the state level. Indian demo, uh, you know, Indian democracy has not been taken over by one leader or one. I am saying the same thing. Unless, so long the states are, even if you lose Lok Sabha elections again and again, but so long you hold your ground on the, in the states, India is democracy. Its texture, its color, its multipolarity are going to stay, and that is very important. That even if you are not able to necessarily win Lok Sabha, don't give up hope. Fight with all what you have. Make sure that you don't lose the states. Maybe there is no opportunity for you to win Lok Sabha, but you have enough opportunity to win your state. Win that and the tide will turn. Okay. Prashant Kishore, for having given us a sense of what you believe is the big national picture as well as the state picture in this uh, huge election year of 2024, thank you very much for thank speaking you. your mind. Thank, thank you. you for having me. Thank you. Hello and welcome to this India Today special. After Nitish Kumar's ghar wapsi yet again in Bihar, the dark clouds hanging over the Hemant Soren government in Jharkhand and the recent defeat of the Congress to the BJP in the Hindi heartland states, most political observers are saying that the 2024 general elections are a done deal for Narendra Modi and the BJP. Are the general elections of formality? Does the opposition still have a chance of making a comeback? Who better to answer that than the country's ace political strategist, now a political activist with the Jan Suraj movement that he has set up in Bihar, joining us now, the one and only Prashant Kishore. Appreciate your joining us, Prashant. Thank you. Uh, after the fall, or should I say the re-emergence of Nitish Kumar in a new avatar, this time back in the NDA, the general consensus is that 2024 is a done deal. Do you go along with that, that Nitish Kumar's decision has virtually made 2024 a done deal? Uh, yes and no, because, see, Nitish Kumar, per se, him being part of the opposition bloc was not that big a deal, first of all, because on his own, he was not bringing something that would have turned the table. But perception-wise, yes, there was at least those who believed in the opposition's strength or the new formation called India. They thought him as one of the key allies or key component of this new formation. Uh, BJP, by taking him back, to my mind, has gone for a strategy where what, we, what one would say, uh, losing, uh, a, a, a losing a war for, uh, losing a battle to win a war. Uh, because in Bihar, per se, BJP is not going to give any advantage to BJP. But in terms of perception countrywide, yes. No, but the fact is, let's be honest. Now that the BJP has Nitish Kumar with it, they have Chirag Paswan with it, it appears that the opposition is decimated in Bihar, a state where the BJP not won really. 39 out of 40 seats no, last no, time. No, so no, the BJP really. seems to have virtually, you know, Domin will now dominate Bihar? No, actually not. If you look at the hard data, in 2014, BJP fought on its own with the allies like Chirag Paswan, at that time Ramlas Paswanji, and they won more than 32 seats. In last general elections, BJP won 17, not 39. The, the alliance, with alliance, they won 39. This time around, with uh, Nitish not being what he used to be in 2014 or 2019, BJP and the India Alliance anyway was doing pretty well. So I don't think BJP has taken Nitish Kumar back to add seats in Bihar. In fact, if you look at carefully, BJP's own number is going to be less in Bihar after taking Nitish Kumar because they will be fighting less number of seats. So why did BJP opt for this? They have opted for exactly where you started this interview. 
that in terms of perception, Nitish was seen as somebody who is bringing together all part, who brought everyone together to build this India Alliance. So by taking one of the architects out of it, BJP has given a severe psychological blow to the opposition, not in material terms. In material terms, Nitish does not, Nitish leaving is not going to matter uh, uh, much. In fact, it's going to reduce BJP's number. And in assembly elections, BJP is going to pay the price for this. But they have opted for it knowingly because they want to win the war, maybe lose the battle in Bihar. No, in a sense, it seems that the BJP has decided that 2024 up ki bar char so par. You see, they are psychologically intimidating the opposition. Would you agree that all of this, therefore, it's the a, perception... It's a part of psychological thing. It is, uh, that's what I'm trying to tell you. It's not a tangible gain for BJP. It's a psychological blow to the opposition. But it's not as much the tangible gain for BJP as much the psychological blow to the opposition. But many will say that the opposition, in any case, Prashant, has not really taken off. This in, uh, India that's, alliance that's, that's has I'm, not taken off. So that's what I'm trying to tell you, that any which way it's not that with Nitish on with India that they were doing very well. BJP was anyway in the lead position. With this new thing, they have given a psychological blow to the all effort which was built around India Alliance. So why do you think this India Alliance has not taken off? Why do you think? Is it because each leader of this India Alliance is restricted to his or her own state, has no chemistry no, uh, no, no, nationwide, no, it's, they it's, don't have a narrative beyond anti-Modism? What is it? Why have they not it, taken off? The first and foremost, the whole initiative came too late. Mm -hmm. They started only last year, June, July. Now, it, any sensible person whether it is Nitish or Mamta or Rahul, Stalin, anyone, you might think how the seat adjustment would be, what the narrative would be, but every